was going to come to Iowa the day that I toured campus. It felt like, all right, this is where I'm supposed to be. I just loved the campus. I loved meeting all of my potential professors. Being here in Iowa City, there were so many things going on. It was such a vibrant academic and intellectual, but also creative community. There's not a person in my major or that I've met at Iowa that I don't feel like I can go to. It really felt more like a family. Iowa does an amazing job of giving you so many different resources to figure out who you truly are when you come here. The coolest thing about being a Hawkeye is that it doesn't mean one thing. I want to be a visual storyteller and a filmmaker. What's been given to me here can really help me with that. I got a lot of leadership experience and I want to use that skill to impact other people. Valuing the people that you work with is the most important thing and that's definitely the lesson that I'm going to take away. Being able to have the entire country rally behind you and having that lasting impact on women's basketball, it's honestly a dream come true. I've never even been into sports. I learned just how awesome it is to be in that community of we are all students here right now cheering on this one thing. Every time I wear a Hawkeye shirt, I always hear somebody yell, go Hawks at me. So I know that that's gonna follow me wherever I go. From COVID and everything that happened, I was stripped down to the essentials of leaning on my people and learning how to allow people to help me. It was really hard to kind of adjust to being at home all the time. Coming from a first generation student, being resilient meant staying through college, pushing myself to be the best that I can be. Not being able to see my family, that was really tough in a way that I probably still haven't completely processed. I'm thankful for the peers as well as the mentors that I've had who have allowed me to be resilient. I would love to thank my mom, my dad, obviously. Thank you, Aunt Kelly and Uncle Mike, for raising me, for being there for me. and My colleagues for some of the best years of my life. My neighbors and my community members here in Iowa City. Thank you, mom and dad. I'd like to thank my fiance for being there and supporting me. Thank you to my friends for making all of this worth it.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Brooks Jackson, and I serve as the University of Iowa Vice President for Medical Affairs and the Tyrone D. Arts uh, uh, Dean of the Roy J. and Lucille A. Carver College of Medicine. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome you tonight as we honor the Carver College of Medicine class of 2023. This evening's graduates will receive degrees from two distinct Carver College of Medicine programs, the Master in Medical Education and the Doctor of Medicine. To all of tonight's graduates and on behalf of the Carver College of Medicine, we join your families and friends in celebrating the culmination of your commitment, growth, and academic achievements. This is truly a defining moment on the path to your medical careers. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the faculty in attendance seated here in the front middle section. Thank you all for your hard work in educating these students in their training to become doctors. We are glad you could join us for this special occasion. Now, I would like to introduce my colleagues on stage who are part of tonight's commencement ceremony. Beginning at your far right is Dr. Christopher Cooper, Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education and Professor and Vice Chairman of the Department of Urology. <laughs> Kate DeSherry, Program Director of the Writing and Humanities Program within the Carver College of Medicine's Office of Student Affairs and Curriculum. We look forward to Ms. DeSherry's remarks as tonight's commencement speaker. Dr. Jane Lindsay Miller, Director of the Carver College of Medicine Office of Consultation and Research in Medical Education and Clinical Associate Professor in the Department of Family Medicine. <laughs> Next, beginning at my far left, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jessica Zuzga Reed, a pediatrician and president of the Iowa Medical Society, the statewide professional association of Iowa's physicians. And finally, it is my privilege to introduce University of Iowa President Barbara Wilson. President Wilson began her term as the 22nd president of the University of Iowa in July 2021, opening a new chapter in the story of excellence and achievement at our distinguished institution. President Wilson came to Iowa from the University of Illinois system where she had served as executive vice president and vice president for academic affairs. As president here at Iowa, Dr. Wilson has overseen the launch of a new five-year strategic plan as well as recruitment and retention programs. And she has played a key role in alumni and donor relations efforts that have raised over $400 million to support student, faculty, and healthcare initiatives. She is a leader and a true champion of the university and the Carver College of Medicine, and we are delighted that she is here for tonight's commencement ceremony. Please join me in welcoming President Barbara Wilson. Thank you, Dean Jackson. Welcome to everyone this evening. It's so fun to be here and to celebrate such a momentous occasion. I'm really honored to be part of this commencement ceremony. There are a lot of them this weekend, and I can't go to all of them, but this one is particularly special, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'd like to offer my heartiest congratulations to all the graduates at this very special moment in your lives. Well, sure, go ahead. Somebody wants to clap. We're flexible. I also want to extend a special greeting and thanks to all the families and friends and partners and children and babies who are in the audience with us tonight and to those who couldn't be here but have been an important part of your medical school journey. I know that as medical students, you make enormous sacrifices in many ways 
to pursue your dreams. And I know that you could not pursue those dreams without the support, the encouragement, and the sacrifices of people that love you and that you love. So I want to ask you graduates to do something a little unusual and just Listen to the directions before you do it. Okay, I know you're good at following directions. You're in medical school after all. I want you to find your people out there in the audience, and I want you to stand, wave to them, and give them a big round of applause, and thank them for being part of your journey tonight. Please, go ahead and stand up and thank them. It's one of my favorite parts of the ceremony. Healthcare and the health sciences are central to the University of Iowa's identity, to the intellectual contributions that we make to the world, and to the applied clinical services and patient care that we provide to the state and to the nation. I thank you for being part of this great tradition, both in these past few years, few years and into the future. As new medical graduates, you are at the forefront of change. That change is only going to accelerate, both in your professional arenas and in society at large. I know that the intellectual growth and the professional skills that you've developed here at Iowa will help you adapt to that change, but I hope it will help you lead that change. I look forward to seeing how you will contribute to a better future for us all. Even though we are saying farewell to you today, you will of course always be part of the Hawkeye family. Your work here will always remain part of our foundational excellence. And your work into the future will always reflect positively on your University of Iowa education. And we hope that you will continue to be a good friend and an advocate to the university and an advocate for higher education, because we need a little bit of that today, too. So please come back to visit us often, and remember that you're always a Hawkeye. Once again, congratulations, good luck, and best wishes for great success in the wonderful years ahead of you. We are very, very proud of you. Congratulations. Welcome to the official commencement celebration of the Carver College of Medicine class of 2023. Well, that was a lackluster response. Uh, <laughs> I guess not. Nah. I'm going to give you a chance in a little bit to do better. Um, I guess that's what I get for having chat GPT write this speech. <laughs> it's actually pretty much the, the, the same uh, response we, we get every year, and, and it always surprises me. Um, but this is a celebration, uh, and so think about that for a minute. There is, um, you know, light life is too short, and this whole world's too full of tragedy not to take moments like this to, to truly celebrate. And I see one of my colleagues uh, made it, uh, Dr. Gina Lockwood, uh, is in the audience tonight. This is her first time. Uh, she's a pediatric urologist like I am. Uh, it's her first time coming to reception. She told me today how excited she was. And I told her, it's great. It's going to be a celebration. Now, Gina is about 11 months pregnant. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, I would have her stand up and turn around and wave to you all, uh, but she's at that stage in pregnancy where it pretty much hurts to do everything, like blink. So we won't have her do that. And I noticed that uh, President Wilson uh, mentioned to you all that it's her choice to be here. And, you know, I can tell you this is actually her favorite graduation ceremony um, out of all the colleges. She didn't tell me that in so many words, but, uh, and in fact, she often doesn't talk to me, uh, but, but, <laughs> but, 
but the nonverbals told me that this is her favorite. So, why do we celebrate? Well, the students, soon to be graduates here, are about to become doctors. They're going to go out and make the world a better place. The tears you see tonight are tears of happiness. These are very different than the tears you see at the law school. So, <laughs> so, so don't, don't applaud for that because you're going to get me in a lot of trouble from, 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 from unhappy lawyers. You know, I, I was in Carver Hawkeye Arena uh, about a month ago when uh, Caitlin Clark hit that three pointer at the buzzer to beat Indiana. And the crowd there just lost their fecal continence. Um, There's kids in the audience, so. Um, it was really fun. It, it was a great, great win, but it was just a game. Don't get me wrong, it was a great game, uh, unlike that LSU game where we pretty much had to play five on six if you count that LSU coach uh, being on the floor. <laughs> And, and if, you, if you count the refs, uh, it was more like five on nine. And then you take a, a few of our players out for those fake calls. Uh, 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 even the ABC announcers noticed how, how terrible those calls were. I don't think they said the word fixed. Um, but it became more like three on nine. But the, the tangential point I'm trying to make... Uh, is that I need to let it go because it, that was just a game. <laughs> Robbed. Uh, on the other hand, what you soon to be doctors have accomplished is real world, real life changing stuff. It's no game. You worked incredibly hard just to get into medical school. You worked incredibly hard for the next four to eight or nine years, some of you doctor, doctor, PhD, MDs uh, uh, work so hard. And you transformed yourself into medical doctors. And I'm going to come back to, to discussing that transformation in a minute. So audience, if we can give it up for our team's victory over Indiana, a, a state, by the way, that doesn't even come close to Iowa in terms of corn production, hog production, egg production. <laughs> We, we can surely do a lot better when I say welcome to the official commencement celebration of the Carver College of Medicine's class of 2023. Yeah! That's it. Oh. That's it. That was so much better. I suspect you just sent Dr. Lockwood into uh, labor. So I will tell you, just as an aside, I toyed with the idea of emailing Caitlin Clark uh, and asking her if she'd come out here as a cameo and just do some of this, some of that. And then I thought, I'm not going to send that email. She thinks she'll think I'm a creeper. So um, I also thought about emailing Monica and seeing if she would come out, and uh, I decided better not do that because I didn't know how President Wilson would feel about being picked up and spun around again. So. <laughs> but Brooks, maybe you tonight. Um, you know, if, well, 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 I know it's got to be spontaneous, but if, if things turn out in the motion, I'm just, just putting it out there. All right, I want to take a few minutes and brag about the, the class and some of their accomplishments. One of the most notable accomplishments of this class is the distinction they had for taking the longest spring break in collegiate history. <laughs> they left for spring break during their M1 year, and they didn't come back for five months. Now, COVID had a little something to do with that. But they were incredibly adaptable during the pandemic. So many of them stepped up. They showed amazing leadership. And in addition to having to navigate the pandemic for themselves, they actually helped us figure out how to navigate the pandemic for them and for the subsequent classes that followed them. They helped us develop virtual teaching methods. And by the way, that class that followed you, they only got one week for spring break. So. <laughs> 
you know, not only did these students help out the school uh, and the local community, they, despite the COVID travel restrictions, things like that, many of them turned their attention to how do they help out their nation and the world. They strove to help address inequities by participating in health disparities uh, for immigrant and refugee communities. They work with migrant agricultural workers. They help basically retain compassion on a global scale. Some of them, by the time they have graduated here tonight, after the travel bans were, were uh, undone, worked in places as far away as the Indian Health Service hospitals, the Ecuador, South Africa, Himalayas, Pakistan, Samoa, the occupied Palestinian territories, England, Sweden, and Denmark. This group's also been very active outside of the curriculum in multiple extracurricular activities. Many of them have focused their uh, activities in certain areas and will graduate with distinction in things like research, service, teaching, global health, humanities, or even healthcare delivery service. We also have several Iowa rural scholars that are graduating tonight. And when you consider for just a moment the breadth and depth of the extracurricular work they did, combined with the work that they've done with patients in the hospitals and clinics, the contribution that they've already made to the college and the hospital, the university in Iowa City and the state, and indeed our, our world into making it a better place really is mind blowing. And you guys have just begun. So this is why we're celebrating. And we owe you a debt of gratitude and our sincere thanks. One more thing, as you'd expect, they're a very bright class, albeit a bit humble. So let me ask them a question. What class has the highest all-time median step two board examination score? Nathan? Ours. Ours. <laughs> it was actually last year's. <laughs> but, but, you did tie them, so it was a trick question. <laughs> I just, <laughs> sorry, I did that for my amusement. Um, <laughs> let's try another one. You're going to get this one right. Which class had a 100% pass rate on step two? Last year's. No, darn it. <laughs> you guys did. Come on. So. <laughs> All right, soon to be doctors, before this all goes to your head, I want to remind you that despite all of your hard work and achievements, none of you got where you are today on your own. As Dr. Uh, President Wilson uh, said, you've had support. You've had support from family, friends, loved ones, teachers, and perhaps on rare occasion, even an administrator or two. So you got a wave uh, at, at your, your loved ones and family. I'm going to give you the opportunity now to show your appreciation for this small subset that has helped you by standing up and giving them applause. Well, you, you can stop and be seated, so, all right. So lastly, in the, in the few minutes left that, that uh, you're still my students, I've got three final lessons for you. First, I mentioned you've been transformed into doctors. You may not feel it, but I see it. And, I, you know, I'm almost always in awe of how much transformation you make in a relatively short time. It's almost magical as you go through medical school. Our colleagues in OSAC see this, our faculty see it. More so the public sees it and expects it of you. And so you need to own that. In a little more than an hour, your family and friends are going to see you differently. You may not believe me, but just wait till your next family gathering. <laughs> when your great aunt Clara comes up to you, 
starts telling you that she thinks the, her hemorrhoid cream uh, <laughs> either caused a severe rash or, or the shingles. And then ask you to take a look. <laughs> now, most of you can politely decline, unless, of course, you're going into uh, dermatology. <laughs> then you're just going to have to take one for the profession. So, I really hope none of you have a great Aunt Clara, and, and if you do, I hope she's not here tonight. So, <laughs> in all seriousness, each one of you really does know so much, and this brings me to my second point. Never forget that in your practice of medicine, what you know is far outweighed by what you don't know. It might be a good time, Brooks, to tell them that there are no refunds. So, <laughs> human beings are unfathomably, I knew I couldn't pronounce that word, um, are, you can't fathom how complex <laughs> human beings are. You're never going to know everything about your patients. Scientific and medical knowledge, as well as technology, is increasing at an exponential rate. In 50 years from now, people will look back and wonder about how little physicians knew back in 2023. I hope those future physicians that are looking back remain humble in recognizing how much they still don't know. With that said, I do believe you can learn something from every patient and every person you meet. Take that opportunity. I've learned from many of my patients and from many of you. As just one example, I'm aware of a young patient whose father died within the last year. And shortly after that, the patient was diagnosed with the same condition. She not only had to then face her own mortality but also underwent a major life-changing operation to give her a chance for cure. I was astounded and I will never forget the courage, strength, and will she demonstrated as she advocated for herself and navigated her way through the healthcare system, ultimately coming out victorious. More than once, her trials and tribulations brought tears to my eyes and prayers to my lips, something I know I don't do often enough. I am so happy and so pleased that she is here to graduate with her classmates tonight. Here's the third and final lesson, and it's the most important one that each of you must know to graduate. In fact, it's one that I also told you at orientation. Let's make it a participation thing again. That's always fun. As a medical doctor, what's your job? Four years of medical school preparing you to do a job and you don't know what it is. I'm embarrassed for you. I've got a list of names. I can start calling on students. Uh, I'm prepared to stand here all night, folks. I got water. What's your job? Okay, this is why we're, we're one last lesson. You have to have it to graduate. Your job is to care for your patients. That sounds like a ridiculously simple statement, right? But I'm going to say it again. Your job is to care for your patients. It is critically important you remember this. Hanging on to it as a universal truth or a true north will assist you in your decision making and in your practice of medicine. It can help you avoid burnout and guide you to a rewarding career and a meaningful life. The reason I stress this is that many things in our current system of healthcare can make you believe your job is something different. These things start to subtract from your job, your mission, your calling. These things obscure, pervert, and detract. Your job is simply to care for your patients. Dr. Doug Canning was one of my mentors in pediatric urology uh, in Philadelphia. He died tragically in a bicycle accident last year. And I learned several things from him. And when I was faced at times with a difficult patient problem that was complicated by their medical condition as well as their social situation, maybe hospital politics, uh, insurance companies, et cetera, 
Doug would tell me, Chris, start with the child and work out from there. It sounds simple, right? It's so basic. I like simple things. Doug was telling me in his words what I need you to remember, and I'm going to say it again in my words. Your job is to care for your patients. Don't just take care of patients. Care for your patients. Your job's not only to meet and treat diagnoses. You're not a technician. Your career is not as an assembly line worker. No matter how much administrators and managers in charge of your clinic schedules and productivity metrics would like to turn your patients into round pegs that, that you are to put into round holes at, round holes at a pre-specified rate, that's not real life. That's some kind of monotonous game, more like Monopoly. I hate Monopoly. <laughs> if you start seeing your patients just as a series of conditions, that's a recipe for burnout and dissatisfaction for you and the patient. That kind of practice ignores the roots and ethics of modern medicine that have been time tested and proven over thousands of years. That kind of practice erodes the public trust in physicians and it is not evidence-based quality care. I'm gonna leave the lessons there. You all have received a great medical education. You've been well-trained. You have a solid foundation of fundamental knowledge and experience on which you can and should fall back on. That's my phone that's ringing and I deeply apologize. <laughs> I'm going to blame Annette and uh, uh, Matt Edwards for telling me not to turn it off. <laughs> you do have a solid foundations of fundamental knowledge and experience on which you can and should fall back on. This will help you make seemingly complex situations more understandable. Keep it simple. You guys are ready to be doctors of medicine. I want you to go forward being proud of your achievements and strengthened in your resolve to fulfill your calling of serving your fellow human beings. But always remain humble in your acceptance that what you don't know far exceeds what you do know. And that should challenge you to be truly a medical student throughout your career. Just like my friend and mentor Doug Canning was for me, I'm always happy to be a sounding board for any of you at any time. So please don't hesitate to pick up the phone or text or email me or whatever you kids are using these days. I am so proud of each and every one of you, and it's been my privilege and honor to serve you. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Aaron Sullivan, one of our graduating medical students from Dubuque, Iowa. Aaron earned a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering at the University of Iowa. As a medical student, Aaron has served as Director of Physical Health and Safety for the UI Graduate and Professional Student Government and as Education Chair for the Carver College of Medicine Student Government. Aaron was also enrolled in one of the college's distinction tracks, which offers students the opportunity to pursue scholarship outside the regular MD curriculum. Aaron completed the Teaching Distinction Tract, which prepares students to be effective teachers and communicators as they transition to their chosen medical specialties. Aaron will begin residency training in radiology at the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> we are pleased to have Aaron introduce the speaker for this year's Carver College of Medicine commencement address. Please welcome Aaron Sullivan. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for the lovely introduction. Um, I wanted to make an addition to my introduction, if I could. Um, today, my graduation marks three generations in my family with graduates from the Carver College of Medicine. Uh, I can't tell you what that means to me. There's so much history in the school and in my family. Um, we were looking at the composite photos. Um, I call them the old ones, the ones in med labs. Um, and my grandpa's composite photo at the top, the faculty include Dr. Bowen, Dr. Phlox, and Dr. Bean. Um, two, Phlox and Bean are two of our learning communities. So 
um, I feel like a personal tie to history with that, so that feels pretty good. Um, and I wanted to thank them uh, for supporting me and for always encouraging me to do anything but medicine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think my dad convincing me not to go to medical school was my main motivator to go to medical school. <laughs> um, and with that, on the topic of motivators, I want to introduce our speaker for this year, Kate DeSherry. Uh, she motivated uh, me to actually write a personal statement. <laughs> I think she helped um, almost everyone in my class. And the personal statement is such a terrifying and daunting task, and she made it so painless, and I could not, th I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of my whole class, honestly. Um, so Kate, turn in the page, sorry. Um, Kate serves as the director of the Carver College of Medicine Writing and Humanities Program, which explores and strengthens the connections between medicine, the arts, and the humanities. Through individual elective courses and activities for students, the program's mission is to mitigate dehumanization in medical education and healthcare practice. Mrs. Sherry received a Master's of Fine Arts degree in Creative Writing at the University of California, Riverside in 2012, and her debut novel was published by Unnamed Press in 2014. She has worked at the University of Iowa in a number of departments and capacities, including the UI International Writing Program, before joining the Carver College of Medicine. I have so enjoyed having the privilege to work with you. Um, and it is my honor to introduce her as, as this year's commencement speaker. Please welcome Kate DeSherry. Thank you, Erin, so much. Y'all. <laughs> You did it, you're done, we're here. We're gonna do again the congratulations to this group. Congratulations on being done. <laughs> and thank you so much for the extraordinary honor of getting to be here with you. I was chatting with one of you on match day, a student who will remain nameless, who was like, we lobbied for you, and then we voted for you to speak at graduation because you know us so well. And that's true. We know each other because we've spent a lot of time together and we've talked a lot. But, y'all, I realize this may not be exactly the right moment, but I have to tell you, I thought those conversations weren't private. <laughs> <laughs> this is not private. <laughs> This is, there's a whole audience here, not just your many, many, many loved ones, um, but faculty and deans and presidents. There's more than one president here. But it's fine, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> a huge thank you to the families and friends and faculty and leadership who helped get you through in one piece. It's been <clears throat> the greatest privilege of my career and some of the most fun I've ever had at work getting to know you, getting to hear your stories. Thank you for this honor of joining you tonight, but mostly thank you so much for all the time we spent together. And in that time, we did have a lot of conversations and a lot of them were private because something about them felt a little dangerous somehow. Like we were doing something improper by being honest, telling all these irreverent and ambivalent and vulnerable, totally idiosyncratic versions of the standard medical school story. But it's actually kind of wild that those conversations ever felt dangerous because nobody perfectly fits into any standard story. So I think maybe that's it. Maybe those stories shouldn't have to remain private. Because if they have to remain private, that means there is something improper or defective about them, which would be a problem since they belong to all of you and genuinely are your experiences, capturing who you really are as people in and out of medical education in all kinds of complexity and individuality and involving what I'm gonna describe as a troubling number of cats, which is an issue to discuss at another time, I realize, <laughs> but there has to be some explanation for what went wrong there. Um, the idea is that your stories, if your stories can be told more publicly, 
then maybe they can start to be understood as permissible, even healthy deviations from that fixed script. And then they become less dangerous. The opposite of improper or defective, they become additive, acceptable, plausible alternatives to that standard story. And you enterprising goofballs, you were like, let's have Kate do that. <laughs> She'll get up there and tell a bunch of dangerous stories in public. <laughs> One of the most profound things I learned from listening to you is something totally new about struggle itself. And it's beautifully captured by the writer Emily Rapp Black in her book Sanctuary. She writes about the phoenix, not as some glorious creature rising perfect and new from the ashes of the fire. She knows, as you do, narratives that neat are not true or at the very least, they're incomplete and therefore misleading. She says, what if, instead of bursting, th heroically bursting through the fire, a weakened and traumatized bird rises awkwardly, just barely, careening through a wall of sky on fire, entirely uncertain of what fate awaits when it finally clears the smoke? Why can't this mess be a triumph? Why can't basic survival be a kind of glory? Why do we envision a pristine and painless resurrection when the world shows us time and time again how messy these processes really are? That is what your stories were about. Nothing defective or improper, but triumph and glory and messy survival. Because here's the thing, despite the fact that this past March an algorithm of cruelty determined what's next for you. Your actual lives are not zeros and ones and black and white and successes and failures or rights and wrongs. If only it were that clear. It would be easier if it were that clear. But the lives you live every day do not work like that. They're blurry and uncertain and inconstant. It's why making your rank lists was so hard. There was no clear right answer. That was the most surreal thing, by the way, watching hundreds of rubric trained medical students making decisions about residency based on vibes <laughs> and like which program seems the most chill. Yes? Yeah. Uncomfortable though it can be, this ambiguity is a gift because look, if basic survival can be accurately described as glory, then any story is possible. For instance, along these same lines, you told entirely new stories about the particularities of hardship. Things like not eating all day, overexhaustion, studying 16 hours at a stretch, foregoing exercise, delaying starting a family, having a family and figuring out how to incorporate that into your medical school life, muscling through depression and so many other serious health concerns without complaint or time off, suffering loss and heartbreak and silence. You didn't describe those things as accomplishments worthy of applause. Instead, the story you introduced was that it's wrong to glamorize or reward serious personal distress. That even though self-objectification and abuse may at times be demanded by your training, that doesn't make them okay. And it certainly doesn't make them equivalent to or evidence of virtue. And conversely, you told a whole new story about joy. Despite how hard so many of our conversations were, we had so much fun these past years. You made it exquisitely, just gleefully evident that joy is not the opposite of excellence, nor is it the opposite of rigor. I watched you fight to bring genuine joy and pleasure into your lives, not only at home, which probably explains the cats, but at work and in your research, in collaborations with colleagues, in time spent with friends, in your relationships with your patients, in all the art and music and food that you made and shared. You embodied joy as righteousness, as excellence. There were no boundaries around when, where, or how your joy could be productive. Maybe that is the story that we don't often or fully tell. The story of joy and beauty amid the broken. Look around at these people. 
your classmates, your friends, your chosen families here at CECOM, your mentors, and the leaders you admire. Think of the patients you've already helped. Think of the people you love, the people who love you. There is so much beauty here, and it lies in connection and care. And that is the slightly heart-wrenching story you told one way or another over and over and over and over. That one need not be a patient here to yearn for connection and care. Think of all you have come to understand about patient-centered care. Consider everything you've observed and practiced, treating patients as whole complex people with stories of their own, people who participate in defining their goals and agendas. That's the ideal toward which you strive, using your training to ensure your patients get excellent care in which they themselves take part. Why would you, as whole complex people, with stories of your own, ever deserve anything less? My friend Emily, who talked about the awkward mangled phoenixes, she says that the need to be creative in the face of even the most profound destruction is a human impulse, a method of surviving that comes naturally. She says, this doesn't make people brave, it makes them normal. Her words remind me of something the surgeon Atul Gawande wrote, that you may not control life circumstances, but getting to be the author of your life means getting to control what you do with them that a good life is one of maximum independence. That's the story you told about care, creative authorship in the face of destruction toward maximum independence. You were clear, care isn't only about treatment, whatever that might be, and it doesn't involve chicken soup or hugs or pity or baked goods, no matter how many times I foisted pastries upon you. It's about allowing other people to be their true selves as fully as possible, without fear and without punishment. It's about autonomy, which I believe is a human right. Each of you is entitled to be the slightly charred author of your own normal life, to have creative control over what you do with your circumstances in pursuit of maximum independence. The truth is, I don't think I'm up here because I know you. I think I'm up here because you felt seen. Another person, whoever, me, not me, someone, saw you as you are, with no concern whatsoever for who you're supposed to be. And you understood, you felt, how powerful that specific kind of care is. Because autonomy is collaborative. We do it together, for one another, which means maximum freedom only works if everybody is in on it. You are or should be in charge of your story. That's how you access freedom. But for that to work, we all have to agree that we get no say and no assumption and no judgment about anyone else's story, whether that person is a friend, a lover, a colleague, a president, or a patient. And that's it. That's the last dangerous story you told, that dissent and subversion, things like critiquing a standard narrative, and introducing new ideas, those are not indications of hostility. Rather, they reveal your devotion. Because dissent and subversion and critique and innovation, these are the ways by which we move something sacred and beloved and imperfect, like medicine, a bit closer to its ideal form. There can be no fight between humanists and scientists between artists and doctors, between patients and providers, between people playing by the rules of this game and people objecting to those very same rules. That's cynical and unproductive. Instead, it must be an ongoing, iterative conversation grounded in humility and inclusive of as many perspectives, as many plausible alternatives as possible. And you can do it. You can hold exactly that conversation. It's already facts. I've seen generosity in you that before I got here seemed unimaginable. I've seen a type of giving that I'm not sure exists outside this space. I've seen extraordinary drive and truly incomprehensible ambition, except that you did it for the sake of your colleagues 
and your patience. But the easiest evidence that you can do this is that I'm here with you. You troublemakers made this happen. You told a new and compelling story about who belongs, who gets to have a voice. Not me, not my voice, you. You spoke up in order to have the final say on this moment. Because you know you are entitled to your voice, individually and collectively, not according to what you've been told, not according to what's supposed to be or what's been done before, but according to what you understand to be meaningful and just and true. You will continue to tell stories that feel dangerous, your own and one another's and your patients. And as you do that, you will render those stories increasingly harmless, acceptable, maybe eventually even exemplary. You will make this place more free. That is what is going to keep you intact. That's how you will hold on to your autonomy and to your humanity. In her book, after rewriting the myth of the phoenix, Emily explains why the bird is like that. She says, we're hardwired to be tethered to the world and to fight for our place within it, to take up space, no matter the cost. Call it strength, call it resilience, call it biology. Being granted a life comes with that innate sense that we are meant to live it, even on the days when any other option seems preferable. What's ahead is going to be unspeakably hard. There's no question about that. And there will be beauty. And tonight is about joy and connection and triumph and glory and messy survival and all you have accomplished in astonishing and distinctive ways. I am and have been in awe of you. You are incredible. The most incredible students I have ever known. And you are so unbelievably capable. Congratulations to the Carver College of Medicine class of 2023. Go get them. Thank you, Mr. Sherry. It is my distinct honor to present this year's graduates of the Master in Medical Education program. Each of the outstanding physicians receiving their degrees tonight bring the total number of graduates to more than 70, representing over 20 different departments and programs in the Carver College of Medicine. The Master in Medical Education program is dedicated to developing a community of academic medical faculty with formal training in education who are committed to creating and sustaining a culture of educational excellence. This community of exemplary educators serves not only the Carver College of Medicine, but also University of Iowa Healthcare, the broader university, and the medical education community at large. Lifelong learning through reflection is essential for physicians in clinical practice, as well as the educators who teach them. Fostering that lifelong learning is at the heart of the MME program and our educational mission. So congratulations to all of tonight's graduates. Will the candidates for the Master in Medical Education please stand? Ah, oh, they are. <laughs> and there they are. So President Wilson, these candidates have completed all of the requirements for the degree of Master in Medical Education and are recommended to you by the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine for the conferring of this degree. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents, State of Iowa, 
I confer on you the Master in Medical Education degree as qualified and designated. Will the candidates please come forward to receive their diplomas? Stacy Appenheimer. Kayla Pomerantz. Matthew Traxler. So now, will the candidates for the Doctor of Medicine degree please stand? <laughs> President Wilson, these candidates having completed all the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Medicine are recommended to you by the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine for the conferring of this degree. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents, State of Iowa, I confer on each of you the degree of Doctor of Medicine as qualified and designated. Will the Doctor of Medicine graduates please be seated? Dean Jackson, on behalf of the faculty and administration of the Carver College of Medicine, I present to you these graduates who have just been awarded the degree Doctor of Medicine. They will now be presented with their doctoral hoods and diplomas. The shell of the hood matches the black material of the gown and is lined with the old gold color of the University of Iowa. The velvet border of the hood is indicative of medicine, which is traditionally represented by the color green. Joining me in the presentation of the hoods will be our Student Affairs Associate and Assistant Deans, Dr. David Asprey, Amal Shibli Rahal, and James Choi. Graduates, will you please come forward to receive your hoods and diplomas? Tonight. <laughs> so. Dr. Emily Anderson. <laughs> Dr. Tina Arkey. <laughs> Dr. Brandon Bacalzo. Dr. Madeline Beauchene. Dr. Matthew Behrens. Dr. Nathan Behrens. We'll get better as the night goes on. <laughs> so. Dr. Jared Blade. Uh, 
Dr. Ty Bolt. Dr. Joshua Borwick. Dr. Elliot Berghardt. Dr. Connor Burke Smith. Dr. Claire Carmaco. Dr. Tom Kassir. Dr. Elvis Castro. Dr. Catherine Shampoo. Dr. Amanda Ching. Dr. Kevin Ching. Dr. Alina Chin. Dr. Karen Chin. Dr. Catherine Cristal. Dr. Allison Cunningham. Dr. Jack Curran. Dr. Jessica DeHaan. Dr. Cassidy Dean. Dr. Jeffrey Dobrzynski. Dr. Emerald Dahlman. Dr. Kaylee Dewitt. Dr. Trey Dewitt. Dr. Jordan Eisenman. Dr. Katherine Fadley. Dr. Zachary Fleischacker. Dr. Corey Ford. Dr. Fu Ying Kai. Dr. Clara Garcia. Dr. Michael Garneau.
Dr. Shade Gafari Rafi. Dr. Cheyenne Godwin. Dr. Grant Goss. Dr. Anna Graf. Dr. Anna Greenwood. Dr. Alexander Greiner. Dr. Zachary Grossman. Dr. Jordan Harzma. Dr. Joshua Hagedorn. Dr. Christopher Halber. Dr. Mikako Harata. Dr. Alexander Hart. Dr. Mustafa Hashmi. Dr. Ryan Havey. Dr. Salih Heberlin. Dr. Allison Hayfall. Dr. Timon Higgins. Dr. Christopher Holt. Dr. Dake Huang. Dr. Casey Jacobs. Dr. Marguerite Jacobiak. Dr. Alec James. Dr. Allison Jasper. Dr. Anna Calgen. Dr. Jacob Kaplan. Dr. Theodore Kotz. Dr. Matt Kelly. Dr. Morgan Kennedy. Dr. Faison Kawaja. Dr. 
Dr. Kenton Kingsbury. Dr. Brian Kennard. Thank you, Tyler. Dr. Tyler Klinsky. Dr. Camila Cazera. Is that all right? Dr. Dhruv Kathari. Dr. Yanni Cornutas. Dr. Kayla Cruz. Dr. Andy Lawrence. Dr. Mitchell Lefevre. Dr. Ethan Lemke. Dr. Tomas Lince. Dr. Corey Lynn. Dr. Lucas Moxted. Dr. Mariam Mansoor. Dr. Michael Mariner. Dr. Laura Marquez Loza. Dr. Caitlin Madison. Dr. Nolan Mattingly. Did everybody in here today? Did, definitely did. Dr. Jacob McClinton. Dr. Matthew McElrath. <laughs> Dr. Mackenzie McKnight. <laughs> Dr. Ethan Myberg. Dr. Jamie Miller. Dr. Sarah Minion. Dr. Timothy Morris. Dr. Joseph Mueller. Dr. Catalina Mullinax. Dr. Bryn Myers.
Dr. Momen Nasir. Dr. Joshua Nickting. Dr. Paige Noble. Dr. Emily Parker. Dr. Samantha Parks. Dr. Pooja Patel. Dr. Malosh Pavich. Dr. Rebecca Peoples. Dr. Eli Perez. Dr. Katie Pham. Dr. Nikita Pathy Reddy. Dr. Nicholas Sahoyas. Dr. Dayton Rand. Dr. Lulua Roas. Rawas? Correction, last name Rawas. Dr. Nathan Roby. Dr. Sophia Rotman. Dr. Emily Ruba. Dr. Ryan Sabaton. Dr. Shakora Sabri. <laughs> Dr. Stephanie Say. <laughs> Dr. Oscar Salas. Dr. Blaine Samuelson. Dr. Aline Sundu. Dr. Pearl Sani. Dr. Nathan Saxby. Dr. Alexa Schmitz. Dr. Christina Sevchek.
Dr. Pombi Silverman. Dr. Zachary Skopek. Dr. Olivia Snyder. Dr. Eric Solis. Dr. Talia Sop. Thank you. Dr. Nicholas Spar. Sorry about the first question. No. Dr. Nathan Spitz. Dr. Joe Stearns. Dr. Hannah Steenblock. Dr. Logan Steens. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Stevie. Dr. Aaron Sullivan. Dr. Morgan Swanson. Dr. Samantha Swartz. Dr. Zainab Tanvir. Dr. Frida Tehran Garza. Dr. Rosary Tudas. Dr. Mason Valencourt. Dr. Ashley Vaughn. Dr. Victoria Vivcharenko. Dr. Andrew Voigt. Dr. Abigail Wallung. Dr. Nathan Walton. Dr. Ryan Ward. Dr. Kirk Welsh. Dr. Cody West. Dr. Anna Wilcox. Dr. Mimi Williams. Yeah. 
Dr. Anthony Jong. Dr. Elliot Zhu. I would now like to address the doctors of medicine as you have come upon a decisive moment in your development as a physician. You are about to recite the physician's oath, which is based on the oath of Hippocrates. While you took a very similar oath at the Carver College of Medicine white coat ceremony a few years ago at the start of your medical education, and as you have honored that promise, the next few moments will set you apart from your medical school career. This oath is a symbol of your commitment to the healing arts and is an acknowledgement of your solemn duty to perform to the very best of your ability. I ask you to think very seriously about what the oath means, especially the importance it signifies to those you will serve in your role as a health provider. As you commit to each paragraph, concentrate on the meaning of your vow and how you must see it through. Thus acknowledging the magnitude of this ceremony, I now ask that the Doctor of Medicine graduates to please rise and turn to page nine of the commencement program. I'd also like to invite Nathan Spitz, our student representative of the 2023 Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award to come forward to lead the graduates in reciting the physician's oath. I do solemnly swear by that which I hold most sacred that as I enter the profession of medicine, my primary responsibility will always be toward my patients. I will regard my patients always as fellow human beings and will do everything possible to preserve their dignity. I will try to treat and prevent disease, maintain health, and aid my patients in realizing their life's potential so far as is possible with the skills of medical science. I will seek to inform my patients fully about their illnesses, and I will always remember that the final decision regarding their own life rests with them. I will never knowingly do a disservice, and I will do everything possible to preserve the privacy of my patients. I will perform my professional role to the best of my ability, but I will never hesitate to call upon the assistance of other physicians or health professionals when indicated. I will try always to cooperate with my fellow professionals and will seek actively to improve my profession and the service it delivers. I will remember that I am a participating member in a larger community, and as a trusted servant of that community, I share responsibility for the planning of social policy toward constructive goals. I pledge to continue to educate myself throughout my career and continually to engage in a critical re-examination of myself as a rational, emotional, and spiritual human being. Please be seated. And class of 2023, congratulations. Our state and nation are fortunate to receive such bright, talented, and compassionate physicians, researchers, educators, and healthcare providers. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge some, of, uh, some other very important people here with us. In addition to celebrating your accomplishments, commencement is also a time for us to express gratitude and appreciation to the parents, spouses, family members, and friends of tonight's graduates. You have helped make this journey possible with your love, support, and encouragement. We recognize this is a celebration for you as well. I would also like to recognize and extend my appreciation to our outstanding 
faculty members, many of whom are here tonight to celebrate our new graduates. Thank you for your dedication and support as you have helped guide, nurture, and mentor this outstanding class of graduates. Following this ceremony, my colleagues and I will be in the lobby where we look forward to congratulating you personally. I wish each of you the very best as you embark on your future endeavors. If your career plans take you away from Iowa, please know you are always welcome and encouraged to come see us when you are back in town. And if you are staying here, we are very glad to have you. And to formally conclude, I ask the graduates to please stand, and I ask the audience to join me in concluding these proceedings by saluting you one more time with a round of applause.